Well, I guess we're starting off on a good, by laughing on a by good la- start. Laughing yeah, good. why not? Just get it all out. Uh, my name is Angelo Bake. I am the creative director and founder of Awake New York. Welcome to the business of hype. Um, and today I have the very talented, uh, well-traveled, educated, um, definitely has outdressed me today. I, I feel like um, I need to reconsider my whole wardrobe now that <laughs> I am sitting next to um, the gracious, beautiful Kim Shui. Uh, thank you so much, Angelo, for having me on the podcast. I'm excited to chat. Yeah. I feel uh, like we're like coordinating colors. Kind of. we, I, you already told me that this is the palette. For yeah, this the, is the palette for next season in a couple of weeks. Um, so, Kim, do you mind... Um, giving our listeners and the viewers just a, a, a little bit, um, letting us know a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I'm Kim Shui. I'm the founder of Kim Shui, I'm a women's wear brand based here in New York City. Um, and I started the brand in 2016. And in a couple of weeks, we have our next runway show coming up. Congratulations. Thank you. So you um, are a product of Chinese immigrant parents, yes. right? Yeah. Came to the United States, yeah, um, and then you went to Italy. You said uh, outside of Rome, yeah, and then from Rome you came back to the U.S. Yeah, um, and I don't want to I don't want to give too much of your story, but uh, there is a point of me putting this all out there, right? And then you spent a few months in Paris and a few months in London. Yeah, kind of so went back to Europe and then yes. came back. So it's, you're a bit of a, a cultural hodgepodge. Yeah, right. And how? How have all these different environments and cultures um, influenced your work? Um, well, I think there's always been like a, like mixed influences in all of my work. So I always like to include um, like my Chinese heritage and kind of mix it with, you know, growing up in Italy and also then like the energy of New York. But I think like one of the reasons I started my brand, too, was um, kind of taking all these different parts of me and turning them into sources of like inspiration and like joy and like kind of like a celebration of everything because i think growing up like i you know especially growing up in rome i kind of felt like i was this outlier because Mm -hmm. you know i didn't look like the people around me um you know and i didn't feel like i was italian enough i didn't feel like i was american enough and i didn't feel chinese enough Mm. so clothing was like really this way for me to like connect with like the people around me and kind of like became conversation starters So, yeah, and I think that's kind of my starting point for why I, you know, really wanted to do clothes and why that why clothing had such a special place like in for me. And um, when did you have like that that white light moment of like, I'm going to be a designer? I mean, I like looked back the other day at like this yearbook, like from sixth grade. And it was like, I want to be a designer when I grew up. And I drew like a little figure with like a dress on it. Uh So I think that there was just always something about it that I really liked. Um, And I'm not sure. I mean, I think growing up in Rome, it's like, you know, art and design is kind of very much like every day. You Mm. know, it's around you all the time. Um, And, you know, art, architecture, design is just part of like daily life, Um, you know, I think it's like walking past to go take the bus to school and then, you know, you'll pass by like the Colosseum and like the Roman Forum. And that was just like, oh, okay, you know. Um, And then um, I guess, yeah, then coming to New York and then having that, you know, vibrancy energy and like the opportunity, like all these different elements just kind of fused into, you know, clothing that I that I make, I think. I love Rome. Rome is part of my, uh, Rome and Florence are probably my two favorite cities in, in yeah. Italy, but Rome, because it has the energy of New York. Like yeah. It has like a hustle, like a hustle yeah. and bustle, and yeah. it's really walkable, it's a pedestrian city. Yes. Um, but like you said, the architecture, there's nothing like it, right? Yeah. And for me, Rome is one big museum exhibit. Yeah. yeah. Like I feel like everything is ancient. Everything is just so, I mean, I just remember, I don't know what it's like now, because I haven't been back for a second, but. I just remember going to school and it was like there were two metro lines. It was like A, B, and then they were always talking about building C. And every time they would start digging to try to get the metro set up, they'd like dig some sort of artifact up. So you, they'd have to like halt all like production <laughs> on, like, on like, you know, on metro line C. So it was very much like, you know, this this kind of vibe of like preserving also what's like, you know, these like historical 
you know, things that have been that you're like, wow, this has been here forever. <laughs> like this yeah. is from like the Roman Empire. So yeah, it's crazy. And even like school there, like I remember it's like, you know, our classes were like Roman topography. So we would go to like site visits to, to oh. start, like that was, you know, and like learning the different stories. So it was interesting, I guess, like different from maybe growing up here. So, so to just bring it back a few steps, you, um, you mentioned why you wanted to go into design, why clothes. We talked about the moment you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I would like to hear what that conversation sounded like talking to your parents. Yeah. That worked like, I, I know mean, that was really tough. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, you know, it was, it wasn't just them. It was like my extended like Chinese family too. Yeah. Like if I'd ever like spoken to like an aunt or an uncle, they were just like, when are you going to like do like, oh, fashion is not serious. Like what? That's like not even a real job. Like, that is just not, <laughs> it's not like a, you know, they were just like, how are you ever going to even make money off of that? That's not like secure. Like, you know, we didn't come all the way to America for you to like not, you know, have like a bet the, the, you know the hope for them is like for me and like generations to come like hopefully to have like a better life not like you know <laughs> not like disappoint right mm -hmm. um and they just didn't think that was like art and design they were just like that's like impossible like you can't make a living off of that um so it was tough at the beginning like it was really kind of like a risk and a conversation that had to take some time for people to like understand. Yeah, and, and the reason why I ask you is because, I, for example, with myself, um, it took me a while to finally, you know, um, commit to wanting to be a photographer. That was my first like jump into the arts. Yeah. I went to SVA and um, I remember I sat down with my mother and I told her I wanted to be a photographer and she started crying. Yeah. She was like, you're going to be poor. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. She was like, you're going to be like, poor. You're going to be a beggar in the street. Yeah. And, you know, same same spiel. Like, I didn't come all the way from Ecuador yeah. for you to be an artist. Like, yeah. no. <laughs> and, you know, it one, to this day, I'm still scared to death of my mother. You know, she's 5'2 yeah. and she still <laughs> packs a punch, you know. But, you know, it, I think it's important for, you know, kids that look like us that, you know, are... 16 17 18 that are that are in similar situations product that immigrant parents because you know it, it takes a lot also because you're an only child too right yeah so, so can you talk about the different pressures of being the only child i mean you know it was twofold right like one growing up like they didn't have enough money to have another child mm. that was one, mm. that was one part of it and then second was like you know they were like this is like our this is the, this is our legacy of like what we want to continue on for you know future generations so you know a lot of pressure on like doing something that is that doesn't disappoint you know your your elders right um do you think you fit in today because i i i don't even i don't know i feel like i always kind of had this feeling of like being not particular like I think I've grown today to be like just comfortable being uncomfortable because I think growing up I was always in situations where I was not like the people around me. Mm -hmm. But then instead of like making it into like a weakness, I think that that has become like my strength. And mm. in many ways, I think New York like celebrates that more so than any other city. Like New York celebrates you being different from, you know, those around you it celebrates like you having your own point of view and um, yeah, like individuality is kind of like, is, is celebrated and having like diff coming from, you know, different parts of the world. Like those are things that make you more interesting, not, you know, not, not, not a negative thing essentially. Yeah. Um, you don't come across as a, an introvert to me, I mean, just from the few. <laughs> <laughs> at all I, I could be wrong i don't know but like just a few minutes that we got to talk before yeah the the you know our our conversation our podcast and us talking right now and just just looking at your clothes you yeah. know and and um when did you start finding your voice you know to be able to express it through clothing i think it just came with like just putting things out there consistently and then kind of like filtering out what you like and what you don't like. Like sometimes right. I look back on some stuff even that I've worn or like that I've made and I'm like, what, that is crazy. <laughs> like, I don't know how I like made that, 
you know but then you kind of like filter those out and i think it comes with like just like continuing to work at it like relentlessly and just like putting stuff out continuously where then you start to like develop what you like and like what you don't like so i think it's just been developing that is just more like continuing to to go at it like i'm still yeah. i still feel like i'm continuing to right. to hone in on everything that i like and that i don't like yeah i mean one because just you know i'm vain right <laughs> so i'm always checking out other people's fits you know like yeah and and your, your fit says a lot right and and, and it's it's loud and very uh, yeah. you know and bold yeah and beautiful you know and I share with you also, you know, um, I, I dated someone years ago of Taiwanese heritage. Yeah. And some of her frustrations, she's a native New Yorker. Yeah. And um, she used to talk to me. She's a voice of frustrations about she grew up in Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, and she would get picked on a lot. Mm. Right. Oh, okay. Because the stereotype specifically of Asian women are yeah. that they're quiet. Right. Submissive. Yeah. Um, they're not going to make a scene. Right. So, like, if yeah. you pick on them, they're the least likely to, like, to say fight back. Especially when you're, like, an immigrant to a new country. I think the idea is, like, okay, just, like, don't ruffle, like, don't ruffle any feathers. Like, just, you know, work hard, you mm. know, like, keep out what you're doing. Just, like, don't, you know, don't. I think um, there definitely was that. Like, I remember when I was first starting out, like, I had this, like, friend at the time who had this very specific idea of, like, what um, a female leader should look like and what they might look like mm -hmm. and i think like unless you're like so assertive and like it, per, like if your character is in such a way that's the only way you can be like considered like a good leader or that you have to like over overcompensate mm -hmm. but i guess like i kind of think that like there can be many different ways of like being a leader or like how that can be portrayed especially as a woman and how does that, that reflect sense. in your work well okay i think for me like it's been using those different elements and then i think it's almost like using clothing as a way to like to be bold also and like to to make a statement um and for it to kind of start a conversation right like mm. someone could be like oh my god i love your i love your jacket and then that's how you start a conversation with that person and also it could be a way to like bridge cultures right like i use some um, a lot of like motifs and symbols that um are inspired by my chinese heritage and then use it and combine it with different textures and fabrics um, that might remind me of like Italy and then you know if someone asks me about that like that can start a story and maybe it's like a way to bridge um, culture in that way yeah yeah because once again just I obviously don't know you that well but you know what I what I am what I gravitate towards spiritually from you and and you know um, is and correct me if I'm wrong right like uh, I, I see someone that's, that's breaking stereotypes and creating new norms right so what like what you're doing today for me like it's going to be the norm in the future for you know a young um uh let's say a young female asian designer you know yeah. like like this because i feel like when i think of young female not even just female, or just female asian designer like i think of ray and comme des garçons and it's yeah. just a completely different aesthetic right you know like yeah it's very japanese you know, but when I see you, I, I see I see the Italian. Yeah. I see the American. I yeah. see the time you spent in Paris yeah, and yeah. I get it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you've definitely been in the ends hanging out. Like <laughs> I, <laughs> I totally get it. Um, who you know, who are your muses? I mean, I think it's like friends around me. I think it you know, I think it really depends on like the person's energy. I think it's someone who um is like unafraid to take risks like that would be a muse i think for me mm -hmm. and just someone who's like passionate about what they do so it can be very varied you know like sometimes it might not be someone like that's in fashion and i'm like wow that is like a muse because of their character and their like tenacity and like you know and then in many ways like i'm like okay i'm inspired by that and, um, and speaking of inspire who who have been your inspirations and in, on your on your path and your journey on my path i mean i think my dad has been a great you know a great inspiration in many ways just in terms of like his character of like coming to the states like not speaking english um showing up at like the tennessee airport with a hundred dollars like one suitcase and my mom and then getting there and then you know he arrived on scholarship and then 
the you know the guy that was supposed to pick him up like didn't show up at the airport so he was like in the middle of nowhere not speaking english and like trying to get to his the place that he's supposed to you know his like school like living situation and no one was there to guide him to get there so you know then there was like an american woman on his fight like got you know was like oh do you need any help got him to like a motel so then that was like thirty dollars and he had seventy dollars and then (laughs) he finally found his way to this this like shared apartment um and he started like from that Mm -hmm. essentially so i think like that kind of and then on top of that like you know he was self-taught because it was like during the cultural revolution so you know he you know grew up he was like an orphan and then grew up you know self self studying and then going from there to you know find a way to go into a school and then going from there onwards right so i think that that relentless pursuit of something i think is like something that constantly inspires me too so that's that's the drive within i think that's like the a drive that maybe is just the like the fight the fight yeah. yeah like the relentlessness of it yeah and and if and if you don't mind you know um sharing with us what what have been some of your challenges you know breaking through this industry yeah i mean i always think it's like uh yeah i mean there's uh, there's Uh, there were so many right like starting out it was like i didn't come from a fashion background i didn't have i didn't know people in the industry like i showed up in new york not really knowing um people in fashion at all Mm -hmm. so it was like how do i get my work seen right like how do i um how do i make something that people like want to wear and like you know how to like how to even get my foot in the door was like was like something I always thought about and like I didn't have something set up for me already. So I think a lot of the challenge at the beginning was kind of doing that and um, like figuring out how to how to do that and like how to make my work better and like make my work stand out. Um, and then from there, it was just like how to grow, right? And like how to mm. actually make it and build it from, um, you know, not having investment or like, you know, basically bootstrapping something. Right. Um, so multiple challenges right like a lot of it is like you have budget limitations and then um you know like how to how to yeah just like scale something from nothing so what year did you come to new york i came around like end of 2015 end of 2015 yeah or like i was like in yeah 2015 okay um and you said you didn't have you didn't really know people here or you had i didn't no so how 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 did you find your people in new york I think it was like, I mean, it was slow, but like I was just, I guess I was like going out a lot. Um, I had found a job here as a pattern cutter, like freelance pattern cutter and was working different jobs. But I don't know if I met as many people through like work. It was mainly just like going out and about in New York. And Come on, let's, let's give the location. Where were you hanging loca- out? Where, where were you lurking? God, where were you I, lurking? Like, I don't even remember where. I was just out like all the time, I think, when I first moved here. Um, And then slowly, like, then we had a little, like, I had a group of friends then, and then it just, you know, started building from there. And then that was when, you know, I started posting on the internet. Like, I told you about, like, the V-Files situation. I met a bunch of people through V-Files. That was, like, my first foot in the door. Okay. Um, And then just, like, building from there and then just also on the internet, right? Like, meeting people on, like, Instagram. (laughs) And then, you know, being meeting up and then collaborating with other people around me, um, people that inspired me or like just just working and like, you know, collaborating with people around me sometimes and finding what works and what didn't. 2016. Yeah. You start the brand. Yeah. And then when is it that you have your your first collection showing? Was that right to V files or it you? was that was my first one. That so was I, your first. But one. I'd been making like small collections on my own for a while um but i think that was when i uploaded my work online okay but that year i was still like working for other people and then you know not fully independent um but that was like my first like show Mm -hmm. and that kind of opened a door for me but then from there it's like just because the door opens doesn't mean everything's good to go right there's so many more challenges that come and every year poses like a new challenge but i think in many ways like that's what makes it exciting um, you also shared with me that, uh, and not not to backtrack too far, but we, we talked about school. And you study economics. Yeah, like I was, <laughs> I was like an econ major, right? Uh-huh. Like that was like a respectable like major to have, 
And um, most of my peers like were went into investment banking. Um, or, you know, a lot of them became lawyers or doctors, mm -hmm. you know, like pre-med. I think I had a pre-med trial, like I took chemistry. What went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I cannot, I can I know, I'm like, why am I not a doctor? <laughs> I mean, I was like in that, like it was like Chem 23, I'm like trying to mix like, mix like solutions. I was like, I do not see myself doing this. This is like so crazy like i'm not like everything i did would kind of go back towards fashion and like yeah what that i would just realize i was like i'm really just passionate about it like i need if i were to take a risk like now is the time to do it not later on like i should try now um so yeah it was just it, it was really strange everyone thought i was like insane because no everyone probably advised me against it right um i would advise you against you probably it. <laughs> would advise me like don't do it <laughs> yeah. i mean yeah it's not it's not easy and i think the the perception that things just happen overnight is like not at all the case you're not wrong you, you don't got to convince yeah. me that yeah it's like i i mean i think that's maybe also one thing that like you know people think you, you when especially when you see it online a lot of it looks like it's just overnight yeah but it's actually so not like people don't see all those like no's and the rejections and like people, um, you know, just not giving you a chance. And then they just see the the overnight, like seemingly overnight success. success. Yeah. Have you applied any of that e-com stuff you learned? Honestly, the I'm like, I don't know if I remember any of that. <laughs> kind of, but I would like to think that it trained my brain to be a little bit more logical in thinking of things. You know, like a little bit more level headed. And like I can understand someone who's like working in finance and yeah. like is an investment. I can kind of understand that lifestyle that they're living. And like I understand like what that might look like mm -hmm. or like how they might think or like the, the character behind it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I quite remember much economics like applied. I think most of it is definitely like learned along the way. Yeah. But I do think the positive was meeting people that might be doing things that are very different from me and then learning from them. Like I have friends from then that, you know, some of them started like e-commerce brands that became very successful and, you know, are completely different. But then I'll learn and I'll ask them questions. Um, it's not fashion related, but then it can be applied to like my e-commerce like strategy, for example, you know, and like seeing what they're doing in a different context, but maybe applying that like into um, clothes. So it, I feel like uh, your formative years were Italy. Yeah. Right. Um, and you, you you spend a grip of time here and then you have, like you said, you know, obviously your, your Chinese heritage, you know, like at what point do you feel Italian? At what point do you feel Chinese? When do you feel American? You know, and when yeah. does that show up in the actual design process? Like sometimes it's more obvious and sometimes it's less obvious, I guess. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, oh, this shape reminds me of like you know something in italy and then like a fabric can be like very obviously like in like inspired by like a chinese motif or it could be you know something that i feel has like the energy of new york but then has like a fabric or silhouette that's like italian and sometimes just mixed sometimes not clear and sometimes more obviously yeah but constantly just i think it's just there like like sometimes subconsciously it's always just infused into it and just like the collage element, maybe I think just right. like mixing different things in a in a way that maybe might not normally be put together. And and if you don't mind giving us some some uh, insight on what does that process look like when you're about to start a new collection? I know what my process look. I, I got to get myself what's hyped your, up. What's your process? We want to know. <laughs> it's definitely I'm gonna have to like listen to some like early '90s hip hop to get myself pumped up. You so know, music. My my whole body of work is based off of music. It's one long, one long soundtrack. Thing. Yeah. You know, like if you really pay attention to what I've been doing since even the Supreme days, yeah. there's always a song or an artist, musical musician that I'm obsessed with yeah. during that time, whether it's Morrissey or Sade or King Cruel or, you know, Tracol Quest, Nas, like you'll see it in the body of work. And then the rest starts coming up. Then I'll probably go to a movie or have to go to the Met, specifically the modern art section, and you know, listen to John Col John Coltrane. You know, like those are the things that I need to get like the juices 
flowing and then I, I love people watching yeah people watching is, i mean especially here and just oh, i mean yeah anywhere really oh i just gave away my whole inspiration Your like inspiration. you yeah like you need to start <laughs> think, like you need to cough up some of that yeah i mean mine it's it's always really different like sometimes it's like okay i saw something like for example this season it started kind of like from like color palettes right like mm -hmm. i was really obsessed with like oxblood and like teal and like <laughs> like there there were a couple um paintings from this artist like kazuo shiraga that mm -hmm. had these like really deep colors that were kind of mixed together and he uses his like body to paint and i think like then i was like looking i was like just really obsessed with those colors i started looking at different fabrics and then it just kind of went from there you know and then this year is like the year of the dragon, the dragon yep. and that's like really symbolic and i've use that a lot like reference wise in like previous collections too so i think that like especially lunar near being like really soon after like during fashion week that was something that you know i'm like that is like a part of the storyline too right. so it was kind of like a fusion of all those um but yeah and then forever like seeing you know people watching and like um just kind of mixing that all together sometimes it really you know I think it that's where it just jump starts and it, it's it can be different every time like sometimes it could be like a silhouette that i see and then just like going from there or sometimes it's you know from a movie or you know could be you usually for me it's it starts from more visually and yeah. then going from there so um I've, you know there's been a lot of cultural appropriation and fashion yeah. right and there's been a lot that's been um siphoned off of chinese culture yeah and nine times out of ten it's not a chinese des designer yeah um how important is that in your work that you in a way take that back you know yeah. have ownership of that yeah i mean i think like i i use it too because i don't think it's something that should be left in the coffin and mm. not use it all and just like kept away to be like okay it's just only allowed to stay like this you know and um I think depending on how it's used, like if it's 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 celebrated, right? Like it, in the way that I I want to portray it and that I use it, it's a you know, it's a source of joy and it's it's something that's positive And, you know, we want to bring out to start conversations and bridge people together instead of just, you know, excluding people from this conversation, not letting them touch or um, uh, try to understand it. Yeah. You know, and like for me, it's saying more so like this stuff is beautiful. Right. Instead of just being like, no, that's just a cheap how that you can only wear at like weddings it has to be in this silhouette and this form. You cannot like touch or break it <laughs> or, you know, um, anything that's traditional should just be kept as is. is I don't I mean, I think it can be depending on how someone wears it, too. Like that's that's specific as well yeah you know if it's not a costume or like you know it's it's worn in a way where that person clearly thinks like okay this is like a beautiful piece that i'm wearing and like i'm celebrating it it's different i think you know right right now there's like a, a huge um korean moment right like um i just started going to korea last year i went to seoul twice and i i'm like fully humbled when i go to korea because it's just i've never been you know up until last year i've been to tokyo over 30 times and just seeing um how you know specifically you know koreans are not looking to the west for inspiration yeah and everything's coming from within yeah even down to fabrics right like they're not looking at italy yeah for fabrics they're using whatever's at hand yeah and basically to me you know i don't want to say making something out of nothing yeah. because it's not nothing yeah but they're 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 making what they have available to them and creating beauty what you're talking about yeah. right so you have you know they have their own music their own art their own yeah. film right their own fashion yeah and it's dope you yeah, know you I know think, yeah it's great i mean i love seeing also just like like korean girl like groups have their moment here, yeah. you know and who i think i was talking to like a retailer and they were saying like wow they wish they jumped on like the the korean like the <laughs> the girl group um band on earlier because they're so the fans are so fanatic in a way that is like not the same as as here like they are so crazy like i think if i whenever i have like a 
Korean pop girl group, you know, one of them wear something, literally like all their fans are in the comments in a way that I don't see for like another, um, you know, artist maybe, you know, that wears something here. Yeah. It's like really funny though, like all like <laughs> write like really crazy comments. So. By the way, I'm not confused. I know you're Chinese. I, I don't yeah. want to go to switch to Korea. You know, the re- uh, there's a good reason why I bring up Korea because I feel like then, like for me, the next next step is China. Yeah. You know, and I know you're not from mainland. You know, yeah, yeah. The, Once again, I'm not confused. <laughs> you know, but like uh, you're at the forefront. You know, as as a as a, a Chinese designer, like w- what do you foresee? You know, um, coming up next for for China and in, in the design and uh, music and yeah, art. I mean, I think there's a lot of exciting things happening there too. Like, obviously, I'm you know, um, definitely like feel like New York is like my home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's gonna be a lot of like there are so many exciting things ha- that happening there, and I'm like really looking forward to seeing like what is next there too. You know, there's there's a lot, and I feel like a lot of people are trying to. Um, it, like even bring their stores and their their brands to China as well because there's a lot a lot of a lot of different um people who appreciate yeah more exciting things and I think that's it's a strong market as well yeah I, I think be, I think the the obvious is the 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 um, power of uh, of the economy of China right the the buying spending right right but I think you know just like how and I can only, I can only speak on street where I don't know about you know high end fashion like I think of a brand like this is never that out of Korea you know it's it's homegrown it's super strong so for me it's just like okay you know there's what I feel like that's about to happen yeah for yeah. for China, for China like the, yeah. the next you the know next. you know it's it's like a little bit of influence from you know Japanese streetwear American streetwear but then it's it has its own you know Korean spin on it and, yeah. and it's theirs yeah. you know um we've been you know over the last few days we've been talking about mentorship a lot yeah you know who who has mentored you um i think oftentimes it's been i so i've never fully had a like a proper mentor and i sometimes wish sometimes i wish i'm like oh i it would have been nice to have like a like a longer term like mentor that has like helped me um, you know, with like business strategy. So maybe I didn't have to make as many mistakes, but mm. then oftentimes like a lot of the people I might look up to as well. I feel like when they started in their trajectory, it's also different from how that might look like today. Right. Like, um, you know, I think if we look at like, a Tommy Hilfiger's success mm-hmm. when he was, you know, starting his brand versus if I were to start my brand now and then grow from there, I think the circumstances are all very different so what might have worked then might not necessarily work anymore now so what i do find to be helpful is like sharing and um like mentorship from like peers right like asking Mm -hmm. um peers that you respect and that you see doing something that you know you wish you could be doing too and maybe asking them how they're how they went about and and did that I think that's been like my mentorship journey. It's like asking peers around yeah. me and seeing how they've done it, like in different ways. Yeah, access to knowledge, trans- transparency right. on resources, you right. know, um, and kind of like back to the original conversation we're having, you know, as being product of, you know, immigrant parents, you know, we, we come from that scarcity model. Yeah. Where it's like you don't share. Yeah. And whatever you have, you hold on to for dear life. Like you don't let that shit go. Or I feel like um, sometimes it's like it's made to seem as if there's only that many res- resources, and you know, only these many people can be successful, right? Mm. But I think it's like an infinite. You know, there's space for as many different mm. types of people as possible. It's just how you express that and if, and how it comes across, like in a genuine way. Would you say that the lack of mentorship that you've had? in your trajectory will now inspire you to want to be a mentor now for, you know, the young Kim Shui's coming up? I think for me, like, I'm always down to help. I think it's just what I've learned up until now is to never be like, you know, do you have five minutes? Can I pick your brain? Because I think that's such a vague statement. Mm-hmm. And so like, it, like receiving something that and even just asking that, yeah. it's like, 
even if I do want to help or even if someone does want to help, they don't know exactly where, right? Like yeah. I feel like being super direct with the exact question and like the exact ask, like that's really helpful. So like if someone has a direct ask for me and I know how I can help, if I can help, then like I would love to. Um, I think it's just being like so specific about it, right? Because like a five minute chat or like a five minute, let, let's talk about what, right? Like what can I what can be done too, yeah. right? I think it's just like that specificity is really helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to because yeah. I know how tough it was at the beginning. I remember reaching out to so many people, either it was like no response or, you know, they're like, Meh, you know, no comment. Um, so I understand that, you know, the, the hardship behind it. Yeah, and I, I think um, to, try to, to try to make these relationships feel less transactional. Yeah, because also it's like, it's not even, I don't think it's even about that. I feel like whatever energy you put out, that's, um, that's kind of helpful and like that you want to offer kind of comes back to you. Mm. So like putting that energy of like helping others around you and supporting other people around you, I think at some point it might not be that person directly, but like some somehow that will come back to you. So I think it's like kind of operating from a position of like being happy to give mm. and then that comes around somehow. Do you have a spiritual practice? I don't, but that sounded really spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually don't. Yeah, I mean, you inspired it. Yeah, you, yeah. You, I don't know. You that evoked, just, you evoked the just, question out of that me. That was just something that like I was like <laughs> listening to. And I was like, oh, that's true. Like it's not, I don't think, you know, that it's always sometimes something that I was thinking about, but I don't have like a specific like practice. Okay. Well, maybe put that on the list for 2024. <laughs> yeah, 2024. Um, is there anything that you feel we left out that you would like to shed some light on? Something that that I didn't ask, or you would like uh, listeners to know about yourself or your, your journey? I think I think we covered like a lot. Okay. Yeah. Favorite yeah. Favorite food. Think... Favorite color. You know, long walks in the park. Favorite uh, color. Yeah. Favorite color right now is red. What about? I would have what never about guessed you? that. <laughs> but just right now, <laughs> just right now, and then sometimes it's like it can be green or blue. How about you? Blue. Blue? Okay. Blue all the way. It's yeah. Well, blue's it's been my favorite. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people are going to get tired of seeing me in blue over these next couple of podcast sessions. But um, Kim, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angelo. Thank you for taking the time out to come kick it with me. Thank you. Thank I had a great time. I think the conversation was great. I think so too. You got to come out to Queens. I will come out to Queens. You know the real Chinatowns are Yeah. Fun. Like there's like a bunch of really great restaurants there that I'm going to definitely come out right. to. <laughs> well, my name is Angelo Bake. Thank you for tuning in to the Business of Hype. Shout out to Hypebeast. Thank you so much. Shout out to Kim Shui. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Angelo. Ciao, Thank Bella. You guys. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. Bye. This season of Business of Hype is brought to you by Bullet Frontier Whiskey. Mentorship is a key to artistic growth, a crucial relationship for any budding artist or creator that's looking for solutions to navigate their industry. The problem is, how do we find it? As part of their commitment to support the creators on the frontier of culture, Bullet has committed to providing mentorship resources to those breaking new ground across art, sustainability, food, cocktails, and mixology, and technology. It's called the Bullet Pioneer Project, a multi-year commitment that pairs mentors with mentees from all over the globe to open the doors for knowledge sharing, learning, and collaboration. Today, we're talking with Oki Jr., a hip-hop artist out of Oakland, California, and his mentor, Sycamore, the label man who helped launch the careers of Travis Scott, YG, Don Tolliver, and many others. All right, yo, let's get into it. What's up, how's everyone doing? My name is Angelo Bake. I am the founder and creative director of Wake New York. And today I have the honor and pleasure of being joined by the multi-talented, multi-faceted Sycamore and Oki Jr. And um, if you don't mind, fellas, if you could take a second to introduce yourselves, let our viewers and listeners know what you do and what exactly your role was in the Bullet Pioneer Project. And uh, Oki, you want to start? Yeah, I started off. Uh, what's up, y'all? My name is Oki Jr. I'm from Oakland, California. I'm a music artist, clothing designer, and I'm also a United Masters artist. And i um, been working with Bullet um, a couple times last year. Um, we did an event in LA, which was pretty cool, the Bullet experience. Um, but yeah, I'm just here, just doing my thing, chilling. 
The revamp coming soon. <laughs> the revamp on the way. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you. My name is Sycamore. Um, I'm a founder of 3XL Studio. I am a manager. I am an A and R. I've worked with such artists as Travis Scott, Don Tolliver, Sheck West, YG, and many more over the years. And you know, right now, 3XL Studio is on a mission to sign and develop New York City artists. Where I'm from, Brooklyn, New York. Mm. Uh, got linked with Bullet and the Pioneer Project to be a mentor to Oki, and uh, feeling good about it, man. That's how I got here today. All right. Thanks for joining us, Sycamore. Uh, Oki, first question is for you. Um, can you uh, share with us some of the challenges that you faced uh, being a young artist trying to break through in this industry? See, being in the Bay Area, you know what I'm saying? We, I'm from the Bay Area, so Oakland. It's, it's like a small area. We don't really get a lot of light and attention like that, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Especially being the art type of artist that I am, like I'm more of like a lyrical artist and that type of sound isn't really like the the sound like that in the Bay Area. It's more like, it's just a different type of vibe out there. So um, just learning how to just stay authentic to myself and not get too caught up in like what everyone else is doing, you know what I'm saying? And just find a ways to to just maneuver in the industry while being independent and not getting caught up in what everyone else is doing because sometimes it's easy to get caught up in when every, when, what everybody else is doing and feeling like you're supposed to be there. So I'm just learning how to just stay true to myself and just, you know, network the best that I can. Uh, Sycamore, um, can you share with us um, what role mentors have played in your career? Um, mentors have been a vital part of my career. I think the most important mentor I've had is a guy named Kiambo Hip Hop Joshua. Mm. He took me under his wing when I was 19 years old and I would just kind of like, you know, just follow him around, ask him questions. He showed me the role of an A&R uh, and he had a really illustrious career. You know, he found Kanye West, started a company called Hip Hop's 1978. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point he was managing, you know, Kanye, Lil Wayne, Drake, Jeezy all at the same time. And, uh, you know, as a 19, 20, 20 year old kid, getting to see that, you learn a lot. Then over the years, I've always looked out and always got more mentors. You know, um, L.A. Reid took me under his wing uh, around 2014. I learned a lot working under somebody like that, a Titan, uh, Sylvia Rohn. Worked with her for a long time, you know, and watching a lot of these black execs, how they maneuver hmm. in the industry you know, in corporate America, uh, balanced out with, you know, mentors like more in the street and more like people who show me how to balance and the culture has uh, really shaped my career. So I've always made it a point to be a mentor, uh, seek out artists, seek out students, speak at schools and, you know, always make myself like read readily available to, uh, you know, to so somebody learn. I don't know you too well, Sycamore, but you know you just did a, some heavy name dropping right now over over those men, those mentors. <laughs> um, uh, there's some heavyweights, man, that you you threw up there. Um, out of all those people, which one had the the greatest impact or effect in uh, in you and uh, in your career? Hip hop for sure. You know he's been my mentor since I was for 20 years. You know and. I, every major life decision I've ever made, uh, I've talked to him about, mm. you know, and it's really important to be able to have those people that know that you, you know, basically have your best interests at heart in times when you really need it. You know, I think mentorship's a huge part of life. And if you do mentorship right, after a while, it turns into just genuine friendship. Mm. But even up to this day, 20 years in, if we're hanging out, we're having lunch and anybody, uh, we have to introduce ourselves to each other. I say, hey, this is my mentor, Hop. So for sure. Okay, you know, um, having someone like Sycamore that you can uh, now have access to, which, you know, I, I think is uh, the first part of the battle is to find accessibility to people with knowledge, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want or what goals do you have in this relationship that you have with, with Sycamore now? <sighs> I just want to just like he said, just a build a legit relationship. Like I want it to be like organic, you know, like I was peeping this interview before I even knew who he was and I was watching mm. this interview. So I know from the jump that he's a good person, you know. So what I would just want is just like knowledge on the industry, how to move, how to do certain things, because 
he's like the definition of longevity. So I just want to soak in and, and just learn everything that I can. And uh, and sick. Um, can you explain to to our listeners, you know, um, how you've assisted in in helping artists develop, such as Oki? So Oki is a self made man. You know what I'm saying? We met through the Pioneer Project, and you know he is now like putting out a new project, the revamp coming summer, right? Twenty twenty four. It's coming soon. <laughs> yeah, and um. You know, if I can help him navigate the space, because he hasn't put out a solo album since 2020, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a key part of my relationship with him is just to show him what it's like, you know, like to some of the goals he might have getting to the 2024 release, you know, use this opportunity to really get people to know who he is and what he got going on. And I hope that people could kind of see, see this interview like as a, a benchmark. So when it pops off, they're like, oh, yeah, like he really saw it all the way through. You know, and I think that's the part of a mentor. You just be able to, you know, I've, I've done it before. I put out a lot of projects mm -hmm. in my career and I've seen a lot of different angles to it. So if I can help them skip some steps uh, from what I've done in the past and, you know, my, my job is, is done. You mentioned, you know, uh, skipping steps or, or maybe, you know, um, preventative kind of like avoiding certain trappings in this industry. What are what are some of those that you would want to share? you know, with young artists coming up? It's tough. It's tougher than ever to be an artist because everything gets so scrutinized. You feel like every post, everything is like walking a tightrope, mm -hmm. you know, and the bigger mm -hmm. you get, the tightrope gets a little higher. Mm -hmm. You know, you go from like, you know, going from like one floor then walking to the Empire State Building. So it's like, you know, every post, every tweet, everything has to be part of your, your, your mission and has to become authentic. And sometimes kind of pulling back from that and just focusing on the music, you know, why you're here, the mission of why you're here, the story of what you are, like, you know, like then and day when you're an artist, you have something to say and making sure you kind of stay focused on that and not find all the trappings of like, oh, I got to do these TikToks and I got to post this and I got to do that. Sometimes you get so caught up in content that you kind of lose what's important. And you see a lot of artists kind of lose their way trying to keep up in this never ending cycle of of content and you know when you get things like different social media you cause are comparing yourself and that's not just artists that's anybody but especially as an artist you know people just like oh like when you going to drop when you going to drop oh mm -hmm. this i'm not this is i missed the old okay like you know what i'm saying like it's all kind of things that really mess with your mental health so times like that more than ever is when you need a team you need mentors you need a strong, a strong, you know, some faith there that you can kind of lean on and be like, all right, I'm doing things the right way. And I could look at things from, I could have somebody here could look at things at a, at a wider view, at a more of a 10,000 foot view versus me who's like in the weeds of it every single day. He's spitting right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's spitting yeah. right now. No, we're, we're about to go right back to you, Oki. Like you, know, you know, I can only imagine what these conversations are like, but you know, what kind of feedback do you look for when you're having these when you're having these these conversations and dialogues with sick yeah, just honesty okay just honesty one thing just honesty and just let me know like your honest opinion like mm -hmm. I, I don't really rock with like yes man like i brought mm -hmm. one person here with me and that's my boy patrick known him since freshman year in college you know what i'm saying and he's always been honest with me like yeah i don't think you should have done that and yeah okay i like that but like I just try, I just want honesty for the most part. Uh, yeah. And this question is for you again, Oki. You know what? What are your metrics of success that you have in mind when you walk away from this mentor mentee relationship um, from Sycamore? Hmm. Shoot. This impact. I feel like just making sure, like I have, I want to walk away knowing, like. Just that this is already like validation for me, you know, mm -hmm. that I'm going in the right direction of what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? So it's just continuing to do what I've been doing, but taking it to the next level. So I just feel like I'm going in the right direction. And with the assistance of this, like it's like Phil Jackson right here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like he didn't mentor it or he didn't he didn't put out some of the some great albums, like a part of some legendary albums that I grew up listening to. You know what I'm saying? So with me putting out my project and having him, you know, he can give me a lot of game on that. So just game, game and knowledge. Like I'm a student of the game. So I'm just looking to soak in all that. Okay. Now, now 
during this time spent with Oki uh, Sycamore, you know, what are some of the the qualities or characteristics characteristics that you see in him that you saw in your in your you see in your own self? Well, you know, it's just like to get to this point as an artist or just as a creative in general is so difficult, you know, to get people to hear your music, to make it out of your hometown, just to put out a whole project, just to get signed with United Masters, have Bullet recognize you, be on uh, the Business of Hype podcast. Like, you know, these are all like benchmarks that validate and just build up your confidence. You know what I'm saying? And that's all I was looking for when I was coming up. I was just looking for people to help validate that I was going in the right way, mm-hmm. you know? And a lot of times coming from Brooklyn, it's just kind of like, well, I'm a, I'm, you know, you have this kind of like this, this this veil on you, like, nah, I'm gonna do this no matter what. But really on the inside, you really want help, but you also don't want to get played with, like, you know what I mean? So you yeah. have to like kind of balance that out. And then as you get a little older, you realize, well, maybe everybody's not trying to play you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or maybe you have some success and people start taking you more seriously. And, but without, you know, the team, it's hard to navigate what the difference is, you know? And my role is like a coach. You know, it's like, all right, well, you know, like you should go back to this because this has been working with songwriting wise or, you know, look at the trends of what's happening here. This is probably the timing to do it because uh, the news cycle is, is the Grammy. So you shouldn't roll out at that time. It's just being able to really focus on his project and Oki's project and figure out like exactly how to navigate to that point of release and then knowing what to do post release. You know, so I got a, a very clear mission and understand how I can help. And bring value. Uh, Oki, um, where do you see yourself in five years? I see myself being a household name, traveling the world, and just building my brand. Just my brand continue to elevate and me connecting with different brands, partnering, and growing, really. Just continue to evolve and grow. That's how I see myself. <laughs> also, don't forget to pay it forward. Exactly. Yeah, giving me <laughs> pay for it for sure. Always pay. And mentor, like I do that now. Like I teach. Like I'm a teacher. Okay. Yeah. So I teach poetry. Um. I, like I been work that been working after school program. I do a bunch of different stuff. So I'm always giving back. That, that's like something that that's in me. You know what I'm saying? Because mm. if it wasn't for the people around me, like I wouldn't be where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? So I just try to give back the same way that you know it was given to me. And Sycamore, uh, my last question for you is, you know, a- any parting words of advice uh, for a young artist trying to figure it out or trying to navigate their come up today? I feel like it's tougher than ever to be an artist and easier than ever to start, you know? So I would just say, like, really, really just focus on your mission and what you're doing here. Mm. You know, I think I meet a lot of artists that, I'm like, yo, I just started making music three months ago. You know what I'm saying? And they kind of get like frustrated and or the grind and the hustle. You know, I met with the artist last night and it was so inspiring. He's been making music since maybe like 2018. And then, you know, the music thing was going slow. So he started a clothing brand, the clothing brand got big. And after the clothing brand got big, he used that as an entry point for his music. And now his music going big. So he put the clothing brand to the side and he's now he's really focused on his music and now, after like five years of grinding, he's really starting to get like, you know, million dollar offers and mm. and different things happen and just just kind of stick through it, stick through the noise. Like there's always gonna be a new social media, there's always gonna be new platforms. Like it went from vinyls to cassettes to CDs to streaming to Spotify and it all comes around. What doesn't really change is the body of work, the art and kind of like the positioning. And just because sometimes, you know, it might feel like it's, not your time right now you might everybody might be doing drill and you might be doing like real conscious rap mm-hmm. but everything cycles and it might come around kind of like fashion yeah you know what i'm saying yep, so yep. you just kind of stick true to what you got and then when you start when everyone else starts comes around they're gonna know you was holding it down there the whole time and i've been that's one thing as i gotten older i've been seeing that i've seen a lot of people who were more relevant when i was younger not really last later and people who weren't as big when I was younger now become looked at as gods, you know, mm. because they just kept it 100% authentic. You know what I'm saying? Like if you look somebody like a Cameron or a Big L, like they, music has aged well. And you know, now, I mean, so many kids are like, yo, I love Big L. But at the time, you know, he wasn't really that big. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But they look back on it like, oh, now this guy kept it 
all the way, like authentic, you know, like even like a Chief Keef, it wasn't super big. He wasn't the biggest artist, but now the new generation looks at him like as a legend. So it's just telling people to kind of stick with what you're doing because you just don't know who's watching and who you're inspiring. And you don't want to just quit before it's your time because just as things start to change your direction, right. you might try to switch it up. And that's the time that you need to, to see it through. Yeah, I, I think um, it's not easy to be true to yourself. You know, and, and I think, um, you know, just to kind of echo on what you're saying, um, patience, right? And uh, giving yourself time to incubate, you know, because like for us, like our generation, you know, like I was probably quiet for the first 10 years, just just studying and, and trying to learn, you know, and trying to figure out what I'm going to do with myself, you know? So, yeah, I, I think it, it's a, it's it takes a while to really uh, learn and understand who you are, and then stay true to that, you know, without being influenced by what's going on around, going or all around you, right? Um, but yeah, man, Sycamore, thank you, Oki Junior. Wish you the best. Thank you. Man. Congratulations. You know what I mean. You're gonna you're gonna kill it. Um, sure. Thank you, man. Yeah, man. My name is Angelo Bake. This is the business of hype. Shout out to Bullet. Shout out to Hype Beast. Stay tuned for the next. Lady, y'all. Peace.